morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Strictly History. I'm Katie. I'm Allison. And I'm Joe. Who's uh, guest starring in our... Guest starring? Who's going to be a guest in our podcast today as we talk about uh, The Big Short and the 2008 uh, financial crisis. So I do have some information on the, on, like, the financial terminology. So as we go through this episode, I will explain certain things. But, um, and I got all this information from we, we, money.com. We reached out, but Margot Robbie did not reply to our emails, <laughs> so. <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> uh, I don't think we're, we're that famous <laughs> yet for that. Um, so just a brief. She's too busy filming Barbie. Oh, oh, is she going to be in, yeah. is she gonna be in Barbie? Barbie? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's been Gosling's all over social Ken. media. Yeah. Like, who's Ken? Gosling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. see? Is there um, a more perfect bar, uh, Barbie and Ken? No, I, don't I don't think, think so. so. Right? <laughs> yeah. Quite honestly. Okay, so uh, I guess we'll start with like a brief summary of the financial crisis, which I got. Like, And as I said earlier, all the information that I'm going to be talking, that we are all going to be talking about, um, but extra information um, is from money.com. That's the source I looked up. So uh, in a very, very small nutshell, the meltdown happened because banks were irresponsibly giving mortgages to people who couldn't afford them, and in truth, probably shouldn't have taken them on. The banks then bundled all of those mortgages, IOU, mortgage IOUs into bonds and other more exotic securities and sold them to big time investors, including pension and hedge funds, under the pretext that they were extremely safe investments. Unfortunately, they were not safe at all. Many of the underlying IOUs turned out to be pretty worthless because someone making $30,000 a year often can't pay a fat mortgage. As a result, the bundles of mortgages and bundles of bundles of mortgages soon lost much of their value too. Because so many investors had been, go had been gorging on these mortgage-backed securities, in quotations, their drop in value generated huge investment losses for major financial institutions, some of which went under, while those that survived all but stopped lending money. The financial system ground to a halt and the economy went into a tailspin as the re reverberations cascaded through the system. More homeowners lost jobs and stopped paying their mortgages, which caused more investment losses and so on in a, and so on in a vicious cycle. So it was one thing after another. It's like Murphy's Law. Anything that could go wrong did. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a pretty good description mm -hmm. of, in the basic terms, what happened. <laughs> yeah. And as, as the information says, it's a very, very small nutshell because it's far too complicated to try and get into the actual nuances of what happened in, 20, in 2008. Yeah, sometimes I think I get it, and mm -hmm. then I start to read more, and I'm like, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, yeah. I, I was in like I was in fifth grade when it happened. Me too. Yeah, okay. yeah, Allison, yeah. you know, <laughs> and uh, I didn't really understand it then. I don't really understand it now. <laughs> so I was a senior in high school when it happened. So I mean, I remember watching like news reports on what was going on. I remember seeing like news reports of the. Um, investigation the committee invest that com investigated the um the big like um ceos of banks like wells fargo and um city and chase and goldman sachs i mean all of these really big wall street banks and just them talking in circles and not really answering the questions of why they were getting huge bonuses while the rest of us were like struggling um so, I mean, like, in my own sphere, I just remember um, um, that, but also not fully understanding what was going on. Yeah. And I remember, like, then out of that, you had, like, the Occupy Wall Street and people having very mixed views on that protest and whatnot. Um, and actually, an interesting fact, my mom bought our house with that before... Um, 
in that like mortgage bundles thing before the market went bust. Otherwise, she wouldn't have been Got able to afford Got in at the right the time. <laughs> no kidding. So the big short is essentially a – it's based off of a book by the same title by Mar Michael Lewis, which is a fictional story but based in reality. And, and it shows – because Michael Lewis, before he became an author, um, was in the financial industry on Wall Street – so he, he's an he's an authority on what he's writing about. Um, so it's essentially about these these what was it like three or four guys who found out that that the housing market was going to burst, and uh, and they took advantage of it in different ways. Um, the guys are real. Yes. Yeah, uh, oh, I do yeah, know yeah. names have been changed here and there and well, stuff, but um, yeah. Well, Christian Bale's character, Michael um, Burry, is a real character. He's um, He was a surgeon who left me medicine to go into an equally stressful <laughs> industry, finance, and he was like one of the first people to discover what was going on in I think I think he was working for a hedge fund at the time um, yeah it seems in, like in the movie he's the first one and then they all learn yeah right. based they on get what rumblings. he did right yeah. right but yeah I, the movie came out 2015 so like six seven years after everything went down yeah uh, and then it's it was the first uh, foray into slightly more dramatic territory for Adam McKay, who before this directed Anchorman, Talladega Nights, Step Brothers, and the other guys. Classics. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. <laughs> I look. I I'm gonna be honest. I prefer earlier Adam McKay to his later stuff. <laughs> but Big Short does have some. Still has a lot of really funny bits in it. And, well, yeah, it yeah. does. I mean, it's not like outlandish slapstick funny it's more um, satire which I appreciate especially yeah. for this movie because the whole thing is like really ridiculous as to how people working in this financial industry when they're supposed to be looking out for the interests of their clients or their investors and the greed and the corruption is so on full display and I it's just it's Ridiculous. Yeah. I like when they go down to, do they go down to Miami? Yes. And that's when, when Steve Carell is like going around to all the people and they're talking to everyone. They're talking to Schmidt and his, yes. his douchey friend. <laughs> I love seeing Schmidt pop up and stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, they're at the, uh, they're at the gentleman's club and uh, he's oh, like yeah. talking to the, to the dancer about her, her investments. And he's like, Wait, you you have a house with all these loans or something like that? Mm -hmm. And she says, I have three. She had five. Yeah, yeah or five. Yeah. <laughs> she just, had five like, houses. More or less a hard cut to Steve Carell just walking panicked. It's like, there's a bubble. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, like, so the big short actually has a financial meaning. Um, it, what does it mean to short something? You're betting against it, more or less. Yeah. You are. You are. So a little more information. Um, investors who short also hope to buy low and sell high, but they sell first, believing the value will go down, hoping to later buy low. Essentially, a short is a bet that a security will decrease in value. The mechanics are a little complicated. I think it's a little, it's <laughs> a more little than a little complicated. Um, after all, how do you sell something you don't yet own? You do it by first borrowing the security with a promise to return it at a later date. If you were wrong and the value goes up in the meantime, you have to buy it back at a higher price in order to return it, meaning you lost money on your bet. Right. And that was the biggest, that was, you know, so Michael Burry goes in there and does this first Jared Vedette hears yeah, about it, yeah. so he goes to do it. That's how Steve Carell hears about it, and then those two guys, those two random guys, kind of saw it coming. No, they found the brief at the- They found the brief at, at the Chase Building, right? It's, no, it was Golden, uh, Gold, Golden Sachs, yeah. I think. 
Um, but uh, so that goes into you know uh, this is a little later in the movie when they start getting into like the corruption of it all. Mm-hmm. But basically, um, you know, Christian Bale's character had this had this all mapped out. He knew exactly when he should be seeing returns, and he's noticing that he's not seeing the returns. Mm-hmm. And the reason he's not seeing the returns is because the financial institutions aren't reporting losses. Right. So right. like. How is that legal? It's not. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I, yeah. And I mean, like, so, and and even, like, the people, the the organizations, and this comes out later on after, as, like, investigations are going into place now as to why the regulators, an organization that's supposed to um, keep the banks and hedge funds and in check, and like you know, say whether or not this loan is viable or whatnot wasn't wasn't doing their job. They were like you know, um, they were being told by their bosses to pretty much rate every loan as high and send them through. Yeah, I really liked that scene in the movie. Yeah, I think there was a lot of good symbolism, you know, showing that people aren't looking at what they should be looking at. You right. know, they're blind to it. Right. And, I think it's interesting too because in the frontline documentary that I had watched called Money Greed and Power, they were they had interviewed um, formal formal financial brokers. I think that's like the the actual job description. Um, how like being a young twenty something coming right out of school and going to work in like a really major hedge fund or. Uh, bank that has been on Wall Street for centuries, essentially, um, and making all this money practically hand over fist, you lose sight as to um, how you're making that money and what's actually being done as opposed to if it's legal or not. Different movie, but like you, there's that great scene in Wolf of Wall Street where like Le, it's Leo's first day on Wall Street, and mm-hmm. Matthew McConaughey takes him to lunch, and he's just this maniac who keeps beating his chest, mm-hmm. and he's just like, I don't know how it works. No one knows how it works. It's all fugazi, <laughs> <laughs> and like it's pretty much just an attitude and culture. Don't question it. We're making money. Just right. go with the flow. Right, and that's that's essentially what these former people who were working in this industry during the crisis were saying it's like you don't question it it just happens and if you do question it then it's like who are you why are you doing this kind of a thing it's like you essentially become ostracized out yeah. of the group of people that you're supposed to be working with and for yeah i think there was a point in the movie too that they did they mentioned like a phone call that mm-hmm. someone had had with another banker and they said that that person didn't understand like what they were trading in the first place. So there was definitely yeah. people there who they didn't really know what was going on, but they just knew it benefited them. So right. why would they I do mean, anything? even the politicians who have started the committee to investigate the banks and what was going on in Wall Street didn't understand the terminology that was going on. So it's like you had subprime mortgages mortgage-backed security. The, the big thing that was emphasized in the movie was um, collateralized debt obligation, or a CDO, which is a bundle of mortgage-backed securities. Yes, a bundle, a bundle of bundles of mortgages. There were also CDO squared. These are in parentheses in um, quotations, which were bundled of which were bundles of bundles of bundles of mortgages, as you would imagine. These got so complicated that nobody really understood what the underlying value of these were, yet in many cases, they were still rated as very safe investments. Oops. There's (laughs) one scene in the movie I like where uh, Steve Carell was at like at like a hibachi place in I think Vegas with the CDO manager yeah, yeah, guy, you're here and he's telling Vegas. him about synthetic CDOs, and Steve Carell is just melting down. Yeah, and occasionally <laughs> I think the editing in this movie can be a little like hyperactive. It's kind of like, all right, calm down. I know you're trying to do Goodfellas, but it, cool, just a little bit. Well, but what, I did really like sort of just the the 
manic cutting cutting in that part I thought it was very effective I mean what I love about that scene is too is like you have his um, Mark Baum who Steve Carell plays you have his employees who are like in the at the other table watching him with um, Jared Vignette and they're like he's like going to the to his guys like your boss is about to explode and they're like <laughs> no he's too curious to explode Which, can I say Gosling is so funny in this movie. Yes. Yeah. God, he plays such a great. Yes. Like a sleaze. A sleaze. I do. I do like his part at the end when you see his check and he's like, "You can hate me. That's a lot of money. I told you I'm not the good guy." Well, he's like he said. He said, um, "I never said I was the good guy." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, like to your point of like a synthetic CDO, which. Even watching the documentary and having it try to explain to me, it went right over my head. But a synthetic CDO is an even more ridiculously complicated kind of CDO made up of insurance payments from a credit default swap on CDOs made up of M MBSs, which are the mortgage-backed security. Got that? Unfortunately, neither did most of the people buying and selling them. So... <laughs> Oh. And now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but CDOs are now outlawed, correct? You can't use CDOs anymore, but they just banks are just calling them a, a something else now. Yeah. They are. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yep. Um, so CDOs don't exist, but they've just taken that concept and moved it to something don't worry, else. worry, it's a CDI yeah. now. Yeah, it's, something like that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, they... They changed it, but didn't change it. They just changed what it was called. Yeah. And they said that at the end of the movie, too, in like a blurb, but I don't remember what it's called. Yeah, I don't remember either. Yeah, it was something similar. Yeah. Yeah. It's just laughable. And and the fact that this really happened is, is frightening, and that it has essentially continued well, to happen. I was, I was talking with Blue a bit mm -hmm. when we were setting up, and like you mentioned the ending of it where it like you know at like the post credits blurb there's a part where it mentions like oh now Michael Burry's investing in water yeah and it's like oh no <laughs> yeah. oh god <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so I mean it's and like and of course because you in, in of the time in 2008 you had a presidential election going on or a campaign they weren't it wasn't the, the election hadn't happened yeah. yet but so it would have started still, during the primaries right you still had um the the um you were still in the bush administration and you, you had people in the treasury who were of the financial industry so i think it, it was um paul um Paulson, Hank Paulson. Hank Paulson, thank you. And a a financial professor, or an economic professor, I should say, which I don't remember his name either, which is really terrible. Brad Pitt's character, right? No. Oh. No, he wasn't Brad Pitt's character. Uh, who was the financial professor? He was in the Treasury. He was um, pr um, brought in to help um, Hank Paulson. Mm -hmm. At the start of the uh, Bush administration. Oh, we're talking, not talking about the movie. No. Oh, gotcha. I'm just giving in more context it, as to what happened. John M. Snow? No. No. Okay. You know nothing, <laughs> John Snow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and it's like they because they are they're big financial guys from Wall Street. Or at least Hank Paulson was from Wall Street before yeah. he became before he got promoted. I wrote down he was the leader at Goldman Sachs okay, before so he was the Treasury Secretary. So he was he definitely was... a guy of Wall Street. Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 That's the other thing is you get you know you put the the, the people that were in charge of the collapse right. in the positions to right. oversee the people that were in charge of the collapse. It's like. What right. are we doing right. in this country? Right. And so you, they were under a policy called moral ambiguity, I think it was called. 
<laughs> That's not a good policy name. I don't like that. No, no, because they were operating under the thought that the market would straighten itself out. You know, that they weren't going to get involved with the banks or anything like that. They weren't going to help out until, like, the 11th hour. It's And, and they didn't see a change at all. Laissez faire. Right. You can count on it for not seeing a change. Right, and so... It's like seeing an asteroid coming towards Earth and being like, you know what? It's going to reverse course eventually. Adam yeah. McKay had that same exact thought. Did he really? Don't look up. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean, finally, like, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing because a lot happened, um, but he essentially gets the money from the Bush administration to bail out the banks that's what they decide to do and he calls every single CEO uh, bank head uh, to come to the Treasury and he sits them all down and they all think and they said this in the frontline interviews that they are going to be um, reprimanded severely that didn't happen they were pretty much given you know money to help them stay afloat they wrote down essentially what they needed to to cover their losses. They were given the money, and by the end of the year, they were they were giving themselves big bonuses, like a good pat on the back. Yeah, where to go? No. Yeah, and the movie goes into that too at the end. It, they know, do. What yeah. happened I, after that? Nothing so, changed. And yeah. I do like the, the, the Gosling monologue about nothing. That is about, my like, favorite part. Nobody goes to yeah. jail, but also, like, I was thinking about it, like, this was, like, six years after. Yeah. I think we remember. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's, like, that whole... You can't tell me, though, when, when I remember watching that in theaters, and mm -hmm. when he does that monologue, I was like, oh, this isn't how I remember it. Right. Maybe maybe I misunderstood things. And then he yeah. goes, no, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think so I thought well, that that part was pretty poignant for me. Right. You know. Well, I mean, I can say, like, when I was in the theater watching it, I'm like, I, I know that that didn't happen. Yeah. And then he goes, just kidding. That yeah. didn't happen at all. And it's yeah. like, oh, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. What did I say? The go. one guy that made, like, a million dollars or three million dollars went to jail? One guy? That's yeah. It. One guy yeah. out of... How many people yeah, that they worked just down didn't Wall like Street? That. Yeah, they yeah. Like yeah. For being annoying. Yeah. yeah. Also, it didn't seem like that guy was in charge of anything. So it's no. like he wasn't, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and it's what I also found very poignant in the movie too is when the uh, when Jamie and Charlie, the guys who are trying to start their own hedge funds from Colorado, and they heard about this and they got um, Brad Pitt's character. Um, what was his name? Robert uh, Rickerman? Rickerton? Was it Robert? It was something Ricker. Ricker. I think yeah. I feel like it was Robert. Um, but you're going to look, look him up. Ben Rickard. Ben Rick Rickard. Ben. See, we were both. Yes. <laughs> um, but, like, after they find out that they can do this, they can get rich, essentially get rich quick make money, you know, what, if, what have you, and then essentially turns to them and goes, you know, you really shouldn't be happy about this. You really shouldn't be celebrating, because they were celebrating, you know, dancing around and all this other stuff in the casino, in the middle of the casino in Las Vegas. And he go, and they're like, why, you know? And then he then goes, um, people are going to lose their homes, lose their jobs, lose their financial security, and you're getting rich off of it. Yeah. You just, essentially they bet against the U.S. economy and they won. Yeah. yeah, and they touched on it too, like that it's so easy in these sort of things not to think of like the individual people right. that, you know, you're betting against. Right. But, you know, like he says, like for every however many people lose their jobs, this many people are going to die. Right. And that's something you should acknowledge, you know, yeah. when you're going to make money off of their death. Right, you know? right. Yeah, and I it's like and I what I liked too is that um, they were good at showing how each character felt about what was going on and their own motivations for betting betting against um, the housing market. 
And so it's like Michael uh, Berry, Burry, it's B U R R, not B E R R Y. Um, he was doing it for his company, for the company he was working for. Um, Mark Baum had wanted to stick it to all of the high, uh, the big banks that they had all used to work for until they realized that their hedge fund, uh, their own startup hedge fund company was attached to Goldman Sachs and they could lose stuff. And, and the other two guys um, wanted to be part of the financial world and Wall Street until it's in, until they realized what was until Ben told them you know this is what's going on this is what's going to happen so I found that to be very poignant in the film as well yeah yeah and I think there is like a turning point in the film like the beginning you know it's just kind of like fun there's mm -hmm. not much seriousness involved until you know maybe like midway through the movie, mm -hmm. it gets a lot more sad and tragic. Oh, Even yeah. though you know what's going on because we all know to some degree right. about this already, right. you know, but that's not the way it's portrayed in the film until you start to see like the effects of what's going on. Like when they go to Florida mm -hmm. and they go to the house and yeah. they see the renter who doesn't know that, you the know. The landlord can't pay the mortgages yeah. on the home, but he's been up to date with his rent. And then by the end of the movie, you find him and his family living out of their car. Yeah. Which is heartbreaking. Yeah, and I liked parts of the film like that. Like, they didn't have to tell you, right. but they could just show you, and you would get the emotion from just seeing. They're in their car now. You know what happened. Yeah. They don't have to explain it. Right, exactly, exactly. What are our opinions on the, uh, like, celebrity cameo parts? See, I liked the cele the celebrity cameos when they are made to like when they're describing what certain things mean. That unless and and if somebody it made it more interesting. Yeah. Because if anybody else tried to describe it, I think I would have gotten bored real fast. Yeah, I like when you know they try to make movies that have a difficult and complicated subject more accessible to everyone mm -hmm. and they definitely you know i think did that effectively yeah i, I i'm mixed on them I, I, sometimes i i think they they play like sort of talking down to the audience like oh you need you, you need glitz and glamour for this to make any sense like there's that scene when like uh gosling has like the Jenga tower, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's like, all right, clear visual metaphor, mm -hmm. the Jenga tower, and then it's just like, halfway through the scene, it's like, here's Anthony Bourdain also, and it's like, okay, guys. <laughs> well, I mean, when they were describing, I think it was the synthetic um, CDOs that, that, or the the collateral, the collateralized debt obligation, the CDO, I can't remember if it was that or that, but, so, Jared Vignette is explaining it, but it's going completely and utterly over my head, even with the visualization, and I don't understand anything until Anthony Bourdain comes on and explains, like, what it is through food, like fish, like the fit, and what for whatever reason it's not selling, and he makes a fish stew or a soup or whatever, and that's what like a synthetic CDO is, and I was like, oh okay, that's a little more understandable mm. for me and a little easier for me to digest. And that should yeah. tell you everything you need to know about synthetic CDOs. Right. It's old fish. Yes. That was put into a stew. Yes. Yeah. And having... Who wants to eat old fish? I, I don't want to eat old fish. Certainly not going to pay top dollar for old fish, but people are paying top dollar for old fish. Right. Right. And having Margot Robbie... In a bubble bath, describe, that didn't hurt. describe some pri subprime mortgages. Um, helped me to understand it just a little more. Also, where did they film that? That was an amazing location. I have no like, idea. Like I wish I was in that bubble bath, not with Margot Robbie. I mean, <laughs> let me rephrase. It just looked like a really nice place. The, didn't they have like a really nice like yeah, ocean no, like, view behind it? Yeah, like, it did. The, like the coolest yeah. resort. Like, yeah. 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 
And I mean, like, subprime mortgages are a risky mortgage loan made up to someone with a relatively low credit score and insuff insufficient income to get a, con a conventional mortgage. Subprime borrowers are more likely to default or be unable to make payments on their mortgages. And that's what the banks want. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think they mentioned too that a lot of times they're adjustable too. So yeah. your interest rate can go up. And right. if you couldn't afford it in the first place, if the interest rate is higher, then you definitely you can't, can't. definitely can't afford it. And essentially what Margot Robbie says is that it's, it's crap. I can't say a subprime mortgage is just full of crap. I can't say what she said on the, in the movie because it's, what does she say? She calls it Oh. It's a full, a subprime mortgage is just is what she says. Oh. Yeah, you can. Oh, uh, yeah, I have the boobs on hand all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to be diplomatic <laughs> and use crap, but, you know. So, uh, yeah, so subprime mortgages are not. Can't put in the vase and call it flowers. That's exactly right. Yep. Yep. But you gotta get do. like a deal like but that one do. South Park episode where they just say it like uh, 500 times and they have <laughs> the counter going. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, but banks and um, I think some hedge funds did do that and they made a lot of money off of it. And I think also too what the, what conventional wisdom told these bankers that the housing market was steady, nothing ever happened to it, so there was no reason to um, dive, like, divert yeah, from I mean, the like, norm. It, the messed up part is that like the bankers were sort of right. Nothing yeah. bad happened to them. Right. <laughs> they were right. fine. Like. Yeah. Yep. And then out of what happened in the financial, after the financial crisis is that you get like the whole protest on um, Occupy Wall Street and people rightfully so are pissed. They are angry and they don't understand why the bankers are still making a whole lot of money and they're left essentially in the gutter and, yeah. and like they, they're homeless, they don't have jobs. They are, you know, they're living paycheck to paycheck or, you know, they don't know where their next meal is going to come from. So I, rightfully so, they're angry. Yeah, like I understand the sentiment. Like if the bankers messed up, mm -hmm. they played a game that they shouldn't have and they lost, yeah. you know, <laughs> should they, you know, have a bailout? Should they just fail? Right. And, you know a lot of Americans at the time probably still do think, you know, mm -hmm. that they shouldn't have gotten the bailouts and they should have just lost the game. Right. And, and quite honestly, the big issue with that, though, too, is like if the banks didn't get bailed out and they did fail, we would have been staring in the face of a second Great Depression. Yeah. Well, it always goes back to in any crisis, if you overreact and you prevent the crisis, people will think like you were overreacting, that you shouldn't have done right. anything. Right. But then if you underreact and the crisis happens, then you should have done more. Right. So. Right. So, and I mean, also on the flip side of that too, is like out of the financial crisis as well, then you got the Tea Party and that whole mess. It, so it's like. I always forget it's an acronym. Yeah. Like, isn't that just just kind of silly? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually didn't realize that the tea yeah, party taxed enough already. That, that was the acronym. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. didn't. I didn't know that. Cool. I learned something new today. Thank you, Joe. Strictly history always uh, always provide knowledge. Yes. I, I think I prefer the rent is too damn high party. Though. <laughs> if you're going for those kind of names. <laughs> the rent is too high everywhere. Yeah. Um, I mean, the financial crisis was to blame for, to blame for a lot of you know the problems we have in this country now. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's it's got it has it has definitely created far more reaching um, complications. Yeah, worldwide too. Oh, absolutely, because banks and Wall Street were then selling the synthetic CDOs. Um, and credit default swaps to banks in places like Greece, Italy, G 
Germany, and now you, Iceland, and now you've got financial, like economic problems in Greece. Greece is, is I think, has filed for bankruptcy. Yeah. I, uh, Iceland filed for bankruptcy. I mean, it's Italy's Italy is always in sort of a financial, a financial crisis. Dire yeah. yeah, yeah. So and, it, and this I think just compounded their their crises. Yeah. Um, it's so it, the United States people in the United States were not the only ones impacted by the finan- the the um, housing market. It was everyone all over the world, and. And I think that just also goes to show too how, how intricately, the what that Wall Street and our financial industries are connected yeah, to the rest definitely. of the world. Yeah, I mean that's why you can see all these trends of populism and mm-hmm. mistrust in government. Yeah, it's not just the United States; it's everywhere because of like the interconnectedness of the system. Yep. And that the financial crisis was a worldwide crisis. Mm-hmm. You know. And, and I think a lot of people don't realize that, though, too, that it was that it just didn't impact the us here in this country, but as we've already stated, um, all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize that the political trends we see here are worldwide. Mm-hmm. And I, what I find to be really ironic is that um, another player in... Um, within like the treasury secretary and stuff like that. His name uh, was uh, Ben S. Bernanke was the, um, was the economic professor who was part of the, the, um, the whole thing with um, Hank Paulson. Who else, where is he? Um, okay, he was chair of the Fed. Mm, okay. Yeah. And it was Timothy um, Geithner who then took over Paulson's position when Obama became president. And uh, again, a financial man, who, you know, uh, in in government. I mean, he wanted to do a stress test on the banks. They passed the stress test. And so everything just kind of went back to, to normal. But he had, it, within his capacity on Wall Street or in, in some other capacity, he had helped to prevent like Great Depression type financial crisis in other countries, in places like, I think it was like Singapore and um, other countries in East Asia. And it's like, you, you have the mental capacity to do that for other countries, and yet somehow you couldn't do that for this country and other places in, in Europe and, and, the, and the Mediterranean. Go figure. I, it's ironic. The only the thing is that I'm trying to get at is that it's ironic. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I think generally speaking... Sorry, uh, it's okay. It, please, please correct me if, I, if I'm just spouting nonsense here, but I think Americans tend to be very very hesitant when it comes to any sort of big change oh, no, in financial systems. No, and, you're yeah. you're right in that assessment. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I think just that sort of real resistance to trying like a, a new kind of method it can lead to that sort of stagnation where it's just like right. okay, we're not doing anything about it, but that that means it's not gonna get any better. Like right. it's, yeah. it's a, <laughs> Right. And it's like that I think it's that concept too of like, as you said, stagnation in when you have um, a policy in place that has never steered you wrong, that has always made you money, because greed plays a real role in what had happened, greed and corruption, and it's, um, and, and so when when you're getting wealthy again, hand over fist, without really doing anything, because really, what were they doing? Um, then then it's like, well, why, why change anything? Until, of course, you're being scrutinized by the government as to why you were doing what you were doing, and then, you know, it's, yeah. And then, yeah. And then you're facing down, a, a, like, a, I think it was um, Ben Bernanke who, pretty, who said um, that, 
they were facing a second great depression if they didn't do anything yeah and i mean it's also a problem now and then you know right after too that if you try to pass legislation to regulate those markets that aren't regulated at all the banks are going to lobby against you right and right. they have been successful. Like one of the documentaries I think you watched too talked about mm-hmm. the Georgia Fair Lending Act yeah. that they passed to try to regulate the loans that mm-hmm. people were getting from banks mm-hmm. because the housing market in Georgia was under a lot of trouble. Yeah. But then, you know, the banks lobbied. They prevented the governor from getting reelected. Mm-hmm. They, you know, basically got the law overturned. And Yeah. You know. Yeah. And they were saying how, like, in Atlanta, there was this huge housing boom. So you didn't only see it down in Florida, you saw it in um, Georgia, you saw it, I think, all over, I think it was like the East Coast, and and people getting these homes that they couldn't actually afford, and then when everything started to blow up, you know, it, it foreclosure after foreclosure after foreclosure. Yeah, they talked about in the documentary, too, I think, that it was hard sometimes to even know who, like, owned the house because right. of all of, like, you know, there was people overseas who had stakes in the house, and it was, like... Yeah. I don't know. I, there were, I guess it is possible, but it just seems impossible. Right, right. It's, like, these bundles, these synthetic CDOs, had so many... There were so many hands in them that there was just... It was a tangleness. It was a tangleness, and no one thought to look at these and see that this this is going to end very, very badly. Yeah, I mean, because it seems like, and they probably mentioned somewhere, like, this is a relatively new thing, Mm -hmm. you know, probably earliest, like, from the 90s. So there wasn't any regulation. It was a market that was new. Unless you pass regulation, there's not going to be any. They weren't passing it. They didn't know it was a problem. Right. And what I find to be interesting, too, is, like, I think in the early 90s, the um, the law that was on the books that were regulating the banks after the Great Depression was up. You had, they had Eagle. Yeah, they had to renew it, and both Democrats and Republicans decided not to renew it at all. And then you had, like, this floodgate of... Um, yeah, I know. It's hysterical. Uh, I know. It's it's hysterical. Clinton era. Yeah. <laughs> and and then you get suddenly the banks have free reign to do what they want. Yeah. And ha- you know, so and then 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 you get this mess. Yeah, the way I understood it was Glass Siegel was preventing commercial banks from yep. investing, you know, more it, than was reasonable right. when they were holding on should be holding on to people's money that right. you know, they're putting into the bank. Right. And then that's gone. Yep. And what happened was you had these banks like Chase, like Citi, like Bank of America, then merging or partially merging with places like Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, um, you know, hedge funds that really shouldn't have a hand in banks anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote down they repealed it out of the belief that it was unhealthy for the economy for them to limit banks' credit. Right. And but they probably shouldn't have done that. When was it repealed? 99. Okay, I just wanted to make sure my, my, my Clinton era crack. Uh, no, no, yes, you're, you're right. right. No, you were, you, were, you were correct in that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, circling back a little bit to Adam McKay, mm-hmm. I, I do think his better movie about the financial crisis, The Other Guys. That was about the financial yes, crisis? Yes, believe it or not, yeah. It really? Yeah, no, at the end, there's like it, it turns into like they're uncovering like massive Ponzi schemes and stuff. And oh, then it, really? It ends with like a really good like infographic animation over the credits just explaining like how everything happened. And Interesting. It, it's set to uh, ma- uh, cover Maggie's Farm by Rage Against the Machine. It's it kind of rules. Interesting. And too, I mean, that movie also has Dirty Mike and the Boys, so. No. <laughs> there is a, a part in that movie that I laugh, I literally laugh out loud every single time. I can't help it. There's uh, Will Ferrell's, like, talking about his past, <laughs> and he, like, progressively becomes this pimp. 
named Gator. <laughs> and he, and he, he goes from this like he's wearing like a like a polo and, and dockers to to like wearing like this full tracksuit with a grill in his mouth and like a big chain. It's so funny. I really don't think I ever laugh as hard as I did when I first saw that. I haven't seen the movie, movie yeah. so. If you can pull up a graphic when this oh, airs. I'll find it. Yeah. Don't worry. It's really, it's like hilarious. And the way that they like point it out, because he's just like, he's so like nonchalant about it. He's like, like I ran a dating business. Yeah. Not him. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> I do so want to say too um, that Bernie Madoff also happened during the financial crisis. Yes. Yeah. It like happened simultaneously. So it's like salt on the wound of yeah. what was going ever, on. Did you see that, uh, I think HBO did it, that movie where Robert De Niro plays Bernie Madoff? I no, didn't I see it because I, I didn't have HBO I at the time. it was Barry Levinson who did it. I, I don't know, but I've never seen it. I just think whenever I see a picture of De Niro from it, I laugh because he yeah. looks really funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... Do we have any, uh... Shout out Mets fans, Bernie Madoff. Oh. Set you guys back for a long, long time. Lou, must you? Oh, yeah, definitely. Why? Yeah. You all got Steve Cohen now. I mean, you can buy anything you want. But it was so funny how he, like, set the Mets back. So much because the Wilpons invested so much of their money with him. God. That's what you guys should talk about on Strictly History. You guys should talk about the Wilpons and how terrible they were at owning the Mets. How about we, we talk about baseball fun. history in general? Baseball, cool. I like baseball. I like baseball there's too. A, there's a guy who does really interesting sports documentaries, John Boys. Okay. I, I, I feel like that'd be fun to cover. Ken yeah. Burns. Yeah. Cool. Ken Burns da, is very well, good too. You know, we could we could talk about another Michael Lewis classic and talk about Moneyball. Also a phenomenal, I thought, really great movie. Yeah. Um, Aaron Sorkin wrote it. I forget who directed it, but I think it's somebody. I think Sorkin might have directed it. Oh, yeah? I oh. think so. Either that or maybe it was like Fincher. I don't know. Yeah, I feel like it was a name like that. Like it was mm -hmm. like, but I feel, no, Fincher did Social Network with Sorkin. Oh, Bennett Miller. Oh, so maybe it was. He did Foxcatcher and Capote. Oh, I haven't seen either of those. So I don't think it was anybody. <laughs> maybe I'm just thinking Aaron Sorkin. And then Brad Pitt's in it. And maybe his best role. So I guess um, any final thoughts on the Big Short? Did you like the movie overall? I did like the movie overall. This is my second viewing of the movie because I saw it initially in theaters and I thought it was great, greatly acted, greatly directed. Um, uh, talked about a topic that in greater detail than how I understood it and found it to be frightening and ridiculous and disgusting all at the same time. I loved it a lot when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. I probably watched it three or four times then. Uh, Rewatching it definitely would left me. It, I wasn't as enthused this time, but it was. I was still like, all right, now this holds up better than I expected. This is still yeah. pretty. Uh, there's some pretty great bits in here, and mm -hmm. yeah. So. Yeah, I, I also enjoyed this. Um, the st satirical um, comedy in it. I thought that it was. It was poignant in certain places about the ridiculousness of it all. Yeah, this was the first time I've seen it actually, so I had, I didn't really have any idea going in, but I mm -hmm. found it very entertaining. I thought like the comedic elements worked and also like the more emotional elements worked too. Mm -hmm. I thought it was really good. Good, <laughs> good. Um, so I guess we're wrapping it up for today. Uh, next time we'll be talking about Peaky Blinders and we'll have another guest uh, appearance of Lou with Peaky Blinders, Joe. If you, I, I don't like, watch Peaky Blinders. You don't watch I, Peaky I'm Blinders? sorry, I, I'm not going to be able to watch that many seasons. So <laughs> I want to watch it, but just I can't do it in that time. <laughs> it's okay. I understand. Just enjoy it. Yeah. Just when you do get around to it, just enjoy it. Take it all in. Yes. Yeah. So um, yeah. So we'll see you next next time we talk about Peaky Blinders. Bye. 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 Bye.